Thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Basil. I'm the manager of the Cyber Academy at Napier. But here today, I'm here in another capacity as uh, an expert witness in digital forensics. I work with uh, other universities. Uh, uh, I'm working as a practitioner with um, uh, lawyers with the Law Society of Scotland, where I delivered a training in cybersecurity. And uh, I've recently been working with Interpol with a couple of projects, like Project Series and Project Leader. So today we're going to talk about uh, digital evidence, and we'll start with digital forensics. Any of you taken any digital forensic courses? A few, good. Any of you planning to do digital forensics as a profession? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, good. Interesting. Six. So. Have you ever been to court? One, two. Were you just attending or you were accused? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you are good at digital forensics, you will never get accused. You can get away with everything, literally. You can kill people using your computer. You can do acts of terrorism. You can become a master criminal. One of the things that have digital evidence that you can never escape is a speeding ticket. It's practically possible. It's easier to get away with murder than to get away from the speeding ticket. But that's another story. So, um, digital forensics. This, the, digital forensic investigations, um, when they're done from the, by the police uh, in a criminal context, um, they end up being received by prosecutors. And the prosecutors are the people who will decide whether someone must be charged with a crime or not, whether they should go to court or not. And the question is now there in the open. Do prosecutors actually understand what they read? That's a very, very, very big question. And I can tell you the answer is not a nice one. There's many mistakes that the prosecutors do make, sorry. And uh, one of them is, first of all, that they take the police report face value. They don't argue. They don't double check. If you go to a doctor and the doctor says, well, you need to have an operation, you need to remove that, you'll probably go to another doctor and get a second opinion before you go into, into surgery, serious surgery, right? When you're prosecuting someone, you should be doing the same thing, and nobody does it. They don't know how to ask probing questions, and the problem is that they're not closely working with the police digital forensic examiners. And that's a problem because the police, especially in countries like Scotland, the police reports to the prosecutors. They are their bosses, in a sense. So there's no communication there. And the other thing that they don't do is that they do not consult defense experts. Any idea why they should be consulting, the prosecutors should be consulting defense experts? Yeah. To understand, to, to make sure that they understand the evidence from the point of view of someone who doesn't have a prosecutorial bias. So they can get ready to what the other side is going to be like when they go to court. So the expert witness, someone like myself. The expert witness, unlike other witnesses in court, um, is there to give an opinion. If you are a witness to an accident or a crime and you give evidence, you are not there to give an opinion. Okay. The, your job is to actually state what you saw, what you understood, or what you heard, and that's it. It's just to state facts. Where, a, for a, where an expert witness is there to give an opinion, and it's a different role. You're hired by one of the sides to analyze the evidence, 
Uh, that goes for any disciplines. And I did a couple of years ago some training that was not for forensics, but was for general, for generally for expert witnesses. It was really amazing course. And one of the people there was a plumber. And you don't think of a plumber as an expert witness, but you do have civil cases with things going wrong with plumbing, and you do need an expert. So there's stereotypes about who expert witnesses are, and they're wrong. Um, the expert witness is someone that, as the name notes, must be considered an expert in their area. And they must be objective, and they should be able to compartmentalize. Do you think you can compartmentalize? It's difficult. Some people can do, some people can't, and it's, it's a skill that you learn on the trade. You're going to defend someone who has committed a serious crime. Can you see past that when you're defending them? Of course, the expert witness is in a slightly better position than the lawyer because when I'm hired from the defense, I'm not defending that person. I'm there to explain the evidence to the lawyer, and if the lawyer wants me to explain to the judge and the jury, that's what I'm going to do. At the end of the day, whether that person walks free or they go to prison for the rest of their lives is irrelevant to me. I'll get paid to do the same job anyway. So it's, it's difficult. Um, but the thing is that uh, for our system to work, for our legal system to work, for justice to work, there is the assumption of innocence and the fact that everybody needs to have a fair trial, even the bad guys. And one last thing is that if you are in the court as an expert witness, you must not give evidence outside your expertise. Okay. I did that inadvertently one day uh, at the early stage of my career, and I mentioned the law. Okay. And the way I mentioned it, it sounded like I'm a lawyer. And I was reminded in court that I'm not a lawyer. Okay. So what happened after that is that there is a loophole. You can always turn to the judge and say, my lord or my lady, I need to refer to that law to explain to the court the relevance of this evidence. Can I do that? And they will say, OK, but don't go too far. You're not a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. Um, when you are hired as an expert witness, you are a consultant. The lawyer or your client directly hires you, and you are uh, helping them with a the case. Your duty there is with your client. But if, you, if the lawyer decides that they want to put you to the stand, then you go to the stand. And once you've taken the oath, your, your duties change. Your law, it's not your loyalty, it's that your duties change. You have an overriding duty to the court. At that point, if there is something that you, you are asked, you must be truthful when you answer. Okay. And you must tell the truth, and you must not hide something on purpose. And you must not take sides. You can, as an expert witness, you cannot say that someone is innocent or he hasn't done it. You are not there to do that. Even if the evidence shows that, your job is to explain the evidence and let other people do uh, uh, their job and make the decision. So, this a couple of my old, <laughs> old students here or uh, alumni may have seen the first couple of uh, uh, cases. So the first one was uh, my first ever investigation of something that was held by the police. And it was in uh, what is now the defunct Dumfries and Galloway, Galloway Costambulary. Uh, it was a drugs-related case. The guy was chased by the police. He was throwing bags of cannabis in the motorway. Uh, um, they, there were a couple of people in the car. They took their 
SIM cards and batteries from the mobile phones, uh, threw them away. They thought that that would destroy the evidence. It doesn't work like that. Uh, anyway, the lawyer, the defense lawyer, asked me to uh, look at the text messages. And um, I booked a viewing at the Mfries, uh police station. I went down there. On my way in the train, I had my laptop and I had the tool that I was using, and I, was, I had already tried on my mobile phone. I also had a Nokia, another model, but it was a Symbian. It was working. I did another test on the way while I was in the train, and it wasn't working. So I, that was going to be very embarrassing. So I was trying to find a way around that. I go to the police station, and I said, oh, actually what I want you to do is to just run another extraction in front of me, give me that data, I've got the original ones you, the prosecutors used. If they match, that's it. No problem. This is the actual mobile phone and the battery. They are in different bags and tagged different because they were found separately. And this is what happened. When the guys tried to extract things with their tools, it was a cell deck, um, there was a problem. They couldn't get the data they initially recovered. So, um, uh, column three is the, what was initially extracted. On column four is what was extracted that day. And as you see, all the handset dial calls, answered calls, and missed calls uh, could not be recovered. The data, the, the evidence had been compromised. And interestingly, there were more text messages recovered. Now, any thoughts as to why there were more messages recovered? Sorry? The you? No, it wasn't connected to the network. The examination was like, a, the two examinations were like a year apart. Forensic tools have been constantly updated. The newer version could recover more messages. <laughs> and I had other cases where I was contacted and said, oh, this is strange. I said, no, it's not strange. Especially when there is a big gap. It's not the next day or something. So this is what happened. But the dial calls, they had disappeared. And it turns out that the tool, cell deck, actually had a glitch with, uh, uh, with the Symbian mobile phones. But also, the police inadvertently destroyed the evidence because there was a setting. And I didn't know at the time, and the police did not know at the time. There was a setting that would wipe any call records that were more than 30 days old. And that was because back then, mobile phones did not have the storage capacity that they have now. So very little amount of space, limited amount of, of uh, phone numbers and names you could store. You would even store SMS messages on the SIM card just to save space. Now we don't have those things, you know. If you don't have a one terabyte iPhone, you know, you, you don't have a smartphone. So, what happened is that the police officers, I thought at the beginning that they had messed up, and then I realized that they hadn't. They had actually done everything by the book. The problem was that the book was wrong. The book was out of date. And what they did is that they had one tool, there were two examiners, and they, had do, they, they performed two individual independent in, uh, extractions, but with the same tool. So if there was a glitch, if there was a problem, it would just replicate the same false results, but the results would match. How do you go about that? Do you know who that is? No, my God. 
You've never watched CSI, the original series. Okay, that's a character, Gil Grissom, and he was a forensic investigator. And he was an interesting character in that series, CSI, the original Las Vegas series. Because as a scientist, every time he had a question about the evidence, he would test it, he would run an experiment. And for an experiment to be valid, when someone repeats the same experiment, the exact, taking the exact same steps, they should come to the same conclusion. In, the, in this case, they should have test the mobile phone with two different tools, and they should have come to the same conclusion. It will be very unlikely that two different vendors would have the exact same glitch at the exact time. And then you would have a discrepancy, and you didn't know, you wouldn't know which of the two tools is better working. That's when you put a third tool, and you decide which data set is the correct one. So the book was, what was the problem? It wasn't the individuals. Uh, another one, and again, Sean asked me which ones, he might, which one of my presentations he might have seen. This one as well, you, you would have seen. Uh, a woman goes to the police station in Greenock and says, shows the police uh, a text message. The text message was from the best friend of her ex-boyfriend, uh, and apparently that guy sent her a message, say, you beep, you ruined my, my friend, you know, he's depressed, I'm going to kill you for what you did to him. The message looked like the kind of thing that somebody who's upset or has drunk too much on a Friday night would have sent. The thing is that she went to the police one and a half years later. Any problem with that? First of all, it's not normal behavior for someone to report something that they felt was a threat one and a half years later. The other thing, though, is that a year and a half later, there are no records. Mobile phone operators keep the records for a year. There is no law about that. The law and the guidelines from the ICO is for as long as it is uh, required for business purposes. But a year later, you know, they, they keep those records especially for, uh, um, for billing purposes. A year later, if no one has made any complaints, you know, those records go because there are huge amounts of data and they cost a lot. And there is a big liability to keep them. So a year and a half later, there was no, nothing. There was a message on her mobile phone that appeared to have come from the, the defendant's uh, number. I checked. The police did not check the guy's uh, telephone. I checked it. There was nothing there. So I was asked by the lawyers uh, if it was possible that she actually spoofed it. And I said yes. And while we were on the phone, uh, I asked her to give me the mobile phone of one of her colleagues, and I just sent a message to her colleague, it looked like it's coming from her, and vice versa, and the guy comes into her, into her office and says, hey, what the hell, what was this message? I heard it, I was on, I was on the phone. Uh, and she said, how do you do that? I said, I'm an expert, I can do that in five minutes. If you are not, you're probably going to need 10, 15 minutes to figure it out the first time. So, Is that easy? So, yeah, of course it's that easy. I used a tool called Sharpmail, uh, and Sharpmail is a marketing tool. You send text messages to uh, your clients, and you brand even, the, you know, instead of putting your telephone number, you brand it, you know, Basil's Cakes. Okay. So instead of Basil's Cakes, you put somebody else's number, and it looks like that. Interesting thing, if you, are, you, if you are dealing with bullies and you want to scare them, send them a text message and put the sender's name as their own number. It will look like you hacked their mobile phone and it's coming from inside. People fall for that. Um, this is what I did. Back then, you know, mobile phones did not even have a screenshot uh, option. I had to take a picture of the screen with my camera. 
This is a tool that I used. So, quick scan of the barcode, go to Menti, and vote. Not guilty is gaining traction. Any more? So the correct answer is the first one. The case was dropped. I wrote a report for the lawyers and they lodged it with the court. And then the prosecutors dropped the case on a proof of concept. There was nothing of evidential value. It was not a forensic report. It was someone that first semester in a HNC in, a, in college would have written about how you spoof messages. Waste of time, waste of public money. The prosecutors could have just picked up the phone or sent an email to the police and said, is it possible to spoof? For, for this message to be spoofed, not to be the real one. Be, before we spend 20 or 30,000 pounds and 1,000 hours, or in this case, less, to investigate. So, What happens when both the police and the prosecutors get it wrong? The next case was something, uh, a case that took place uh, before the pandemic. Uh, it was a very, very interesting case. Uh, a guy was accused of being the possession of two class C pictures of children. Uh, the classifications is A, B, C. A is the worst and the most extreme cases, and C is the softer end of the spectrum. Okay, and the less disturbing, let's, let me put it this way. Um, so for me, you know, uh, as, no matter what I try, as I try to, you know, as you try to, you know, uh, disassociate yourself from the person, uh, you look at the evidence and you look at uh, little details. And one of the details was on the search warrant. And the search warrant did not say how did the police get their information which means it was more likely than not that someone called the police instead of the ISP giving them that information. Because if it was the ISP, they would be named on the, on the warrant. For someone to know that someone had two pictures like that, they must have either have seen, and people who do things like that don't share it with others unless they are um, in the same group, or someone must have had access to his devices. Or someone must have, might have planted those two pictures. The police investigated and they found 250,000 adult porn pictures on his device. A quarter of a million. Two of them, they suspected to be between 12 and 15 years old. Now that's a problem. These were two girls. It's very difficult to say if a girl is, if a girl or a boy is 15 or 16 years old. I mean, the police gave a range between 12 and 15. So if it was 15, who was to say that it wasn't 16? Where other, other images are like, you know, 
like babies. There was no question about that. And there were two pictures which in a pool of a quarter of a million. Now, from my experience, this is not the behavior of someone who is watching this kind of material. Is the internet, the, the device behavior of someone who clicked on something that popped up, closed the window, and that was it. A couple of picture, pictures were stored there, or in whatever way. Anyway, the case uh, went forward. Um, One of the things that happened is that the police went to his uh, truck, he was a truck driver, and they seized seven items. However, when I asked to get access, the police asked me to come with a dongle for Celebrite. I said, I don't have a Celebrite dongle. Uh, can I just use yours? Or uh, can you just... Um, um, just give me the information I want. It's just metadata for two pictures. It's not a big deal. It's actually less work for you to extract them and even email them. It doesn't have to be secure. It was just metadata. It's not personally identifiable and it's not contraband. It's not the actual picture. No, they said, no, it's not our job to, uh, to provide uh, data sets for the defense. So, the lawyer, uh, uh, actually the guy did not have a lawyer. Uh, he was a truck driver with no technical background, and he was dyslectic, and he decided that's a good idea to defend himself. Okay, he had problem reading the, the, the legal documents. I told him he needs to get a lawyer. It was so bad that actually the prosecutor called me in his office and he said, you need to tell your client to get a lawyer. And, I, and because the guy was 50 pounds over the threshold to get legal aid, he couldn't get that. So. Uh, the prosecutor asked the judge, and the judge appointed a lawyer. And that lawyer it was a very, is a very competent criminal lawyer. Uh, I told him what happened. I said, he said, how do you want to proceed with that? I said, uh, we'll just go after the report. And we don't, we don't look at the evidence, because if you start looking at the evidence, the police might start digging deeper. So fine. So we went through the defense. Um, the files were not in the image gallery of the, of the mobile phone, they were in the Google app, okay? And that means that anyone who would have access to his Gmail account or his laptop where he would be connected could go there and, and upload these pictures. Also, he was using public computers. He was a truck driver, driving around the country using internet cafes. His idea of logging out is closing the browser, okay? Um, when the police was questioned about checking Google logs to see where the, where the images were uploaded from, they said that they didn't think it was relevant. When they asked if the photos were uploaded from the app or a browser, they said that they did not know and they didn't investigate because they didn't think it was relevant. So the, I prepared some uh, questions for the defense solicitor and he went um, around and one of the things that was in the report was that the police in, uh, investigator browsed the pictures. So the question is, did you use a tool, forensic tool to browse the pictures? Or no, I, I opened the mobile phone and I clicked on the thumbnails and I opened the pictures. The, que the next question is, wouldn't that change the metadata in the evidence? Um, we're not sure. Probably. I have to say that that individual investigator was, is now the exception to the rules. These are the four basic principles uh, in digital evidence from the ACPO guidelines. You, you've come across that in, in your court. They failed to actually abide by those rules. So what I did is I took a picture, you see this from my, uh, my Google Photos, and I uploaded this picture, the one with a meeting. Uh, the picture was from uh, um, a photo depository where I actually downloaded. So it was a known picture. It, was, it had known metadata. I put it there. 
And I discovered that it doesn't go as the last one in the gallery. It goes where the date of the picture of the metadata is. So if you upload something, that a picture that was taken last Christmas, it's not going to be at the recent one. It's going to be in the last Christmas. And when the judge asked about that, um, the, the police could not even reply to that one. But I had, I had already answered that. And <clears throat> as, I, as I said, I'm not a lawyer, but it's a defense that the person uh, had not himself seen the photograph or should the photograph and did not know or had any cause to suspect it was indecent. The way, the way that you could, there are two ways mainly to prove that someone had seen a photograph. Either there is browsing history, usually Internet Explorer used to do this thing, and the other one is the metadata in the picture will tell you when it was last seen. The pictures did not have any of that metadata, and there was nothing else. Interestingly, the police report also said that there was no searches for this kind of material. Okay, so there was no context. That's one of the biggest problems with this evidence. We lack, often we lack context. Those pictures existed. There was no question about that. But that was not the argument. Just because they exist doesn't mean that the guy is guilty. Um, good question. Uh, you, would, you would be able to see that if you, if you had, for example, internet activity that shows that it came like that. Or if you had um, a record on local browsing that shows that you know, it was initially stored in a USB drive. So you know, you know that it was downloaded from that drive. Um, if you were not, yes, if, if you were not using, for example, Chrome and you hadn't synced your browsing history, yes, that evidence would not be there. But if it was uploaded on your, um, on your Google photo app on the, desk, on the desktop at the cafe, the records, because you had logged into your Google uh, photo, up, the records would show that it was from that place. And that would have make things easier. You upload them from an internet cafe in Manchester and the guy was in Glasgow. He was a truck driver, there were records. Okay, it could be as simple as that. Nobody had checked that. Um, the police had proven that at some point, as I said, some unknown point in time, there were two images there. But there was no context. Um, we said those things. Uh, and all those things could have been proven if people just look at logs and just dug a little bit uh, deeper. But the problem is that the police have a specific job to do. If there is a compla complaint, they investigate. They write down what they found and they give it to the, uh, to the prosecutors, the fiscals here, okay? And when you do that, the fiscals need to tell the police, oh, I need you to investigate deeper. I need you to prove that, okay? That's the problem. Um, the other thing is that the defense lawyer actually asked me, said, Basil, the report talks about two items. What, what is the other five? I said, what other five? And he sent me the records from the, the seizure, and there were seven items that were seized. Uh, everything was signed for. In forensic reports, especially with the police, what would happen is that they would decide which, which items were relevant, and they would list everything else and they would say, oh, we did not investigate this because they were irrelevant or not working or whatever. There was not a mention anywhere. So they called in the police officer who did that, and guess what? 
nobody could give a straight answer as to where those five items were. They had lost five of the seven items they seized. Um, things were a couple of th file names in the SD card. The things that uh, we talk about were actually on the mobile phone. The mobile phone was attributed to the defendant. There was no question about that. The SD card, although the guy said, oh, yes, that was the card, the, the, the fact of the matter is that it didn't have anything attributable. And the guy said, oh, I bought these SD cards from a car boot sale because I was saving my trips on my sat nav. Uh, so he, those things could have been there, but the URLs are not an evidence themselves. Just a file name that indicates something contraband is not a, is an indication for you to dig deeper. It's not evidence. You cannot convict someone of that. Just because someone's clothes smells of cannabis doesn't mean that they run a drug cartel. So, the police did not provide any evidence that the accused had uploaded the images, that they actually knew that the images were there, or uh, if they ever ac access them. The next case is going to be, is a case about, and this is a new song, is about uh, a case of jury. And the jury is, as we used to really say, the backbone of our legal system, of our judicial system. That being said, the jury is the most unpredictable thing in our legal system. You will excuse me. And the jury will be people like you and me, but you are here and you are studying cybersecurity and digital forensics and I'm a work on digital forensics for 15 years, if we are in a jury, we will understand the evidence differently than someone who doesn't own a laptop or doesn't own a smartphone. Because there is no other selection, it's a random selection. And that's it. So the jury are not really equipped to answer these questions. I mean, to answer complicated questions and technical questions. So, let's play jury this time. Well, I'll, I'm not going to play jury, you are. The police received um, intelligence that a device connected to a router at the grandmother's house, which is we call address one, contained CSAM, that's child sexual abuse material, and was available to share it means that the computer, either a desktop or a laptop, had a peer-to-peer -peer tool, a torrent, and it had a public folder, and these pictures were in the public folder, the folder where people download or keep things available for other people in the torrent to share. It didn't say that they were downloaded. It said that they were there. Okay. Make a note of that. The address one was the residence of the grandmother, but the internet connection belonged to her son, who lived in address two. So far, okay? Uh, police investigated, oh, 10 minutes, okay. Police investigated, and they uh, said that they found out that the the router belongs to that person address two, and they went to address two and they executed the search warrant instead of going to address one where things happened. They found different computers and mobile phones and they found 20 images of children on the laptop that belongs to the grandson or son, actually the stepson. The mother of the boy also lives in the house. The suspect device, the suspect device that police identified initially was connected to address one. Um, 
the, the pictures, the file names or hash values were not identified. It was an unknown device and it had this public folder. The grandmother and son had access to that home. home. The grandson did not have access to the home. He did not have a relationship with the grandmother. He had never set foot and that was by the statement of the grandmother. And internet account obviously was on her son's. The boy's laptop, they found 20 pictures, no searches, no peer-to-peer -peer software, no public folder available. All, sees, all pictures had the same timestamp to the second. What does that usually imply? If you have 20 files and they all have the same creation, date, and time. Yes. Usually, usually, most likely than not, and the police actually accepted that, more likely than not, they were in a zip file, you extract the zip file, and that's what happened. The, the stepfather had access to that laptop. Okay. Um, and some of the images were thumbnails, which are system generated, and a thumbnail should not count towards the prosecution of someone as in the count of pictures because they did, even if they got the pictures on purpose, these thumbnails were created by the system. So, the boy was charged with the possession of that material, three charges in total, two of them were dismissed after the defense presented uh, my evidence. Um, the charge of making and distribution was done, and then when two of the charges were dropped, the prosecutor came up with an alternative uh, theory that the boy was sitting outside her grandmother's, his grandmother's, and he was accessing the Wi-Fi. So he was sitting for two and a half hours outside her grandmother's house, connected to a Wi-Fi that he has no access and didn't know the password. Okay. Now, the accused had no access, as I said, blah, blah. There was no context as to why about the pictures. Um, the police accepted the, that it was more likely they were put there by a, a zip file, which most likely was uh, brought up by a USB key. And, and the laptop that was seized from, from the address two was not the device that was connected to address one. That's, that's a fact. There was nothing to connect those two things. So these are the players explained. Address one, grandmother's Wi-Fi, the people, the devices. And this shows who has access to what. Grandmother, step, uh, the, her son or stepfather, the boy in the middle, the mother, and at the end, the police. Grandma's house and Wi-Fi, the suspect laptop, address to the, the guy's laptop, and the other two. So, what do you think? Go here, please. As many of you as, as you can. I will appreciate, I want to see how you would vote. Thank you for your participation. This is what happens. Remember, you have three options. Guilty, not guilty, and not proven. Scotland is one of the two countries in the world, I don't remember who's the other one, that has a third option, not proven. Not guilty, not proven are the same thing. You walk out and you don't have a criminal record. But they mean different things. So. These are the players, these are the facts. <coughs> Sorry. Q. 
keep voting. Interesting. Most of you think that is not proven during the trial and um, not guilty. Anyone else who wants to vote? Good. Let, thank you very much. So 70%, well, all of them said that he was not guilty for different ways. Here's what happened. The jury found him guilty with a majority. See what the problem is now? I had the same presentation in Zagreb a month ago, and the audience were all digital forensic experts, and everybody voted just like you did. Not a single person in the room said he would be guilty. There was not enough evidence to prove that he was guilty. It's more likely than not that the stepfather had framed him to take the suspicion away. Okay. I can say this now. I couldn't say that in court. <laughs> Obviously, I couldn't accuse someone else. But I could say that it's more likely than not that this was interfered by someone else. Who that is, that's not a problem. Very unlikely to be the grandmother because she had no access. Okay, and also unlikely to be the mother, because she was never in the suspect pool. There was only one major suspect there. So police and prosecutors, just five minutes, I'll, I'll be finishing. Um, as I said, when I started uh, 15 years ago, police and prosecutors were bad, really bad. I mean, I had a spreadsheet, and I would rank police uh, forensics uh, people with how bad they were, and I would get a, a report of the next case, and I would read the name on the cover page, and I would know how bad it was. I would know how bad the case would go down just by seeing the name on the, literally. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. It was that bad. What happened since then is that, ah, back then, they would get someone from traffic police. Do you know how to send an email? Do you, want to browse? Do you know how to browse uh, the internet? Yes. One week of FTK training, one week of Celebrite training, you are a forensic expert. The case before with the two pictures, it was that bad. The, the, the police expert had four certifications, vendor certifications, and 10 years of experience. I had seven years in the university and 10 years of experience. And the procurator fiscal, the prosecutor, asked him if my training is as good as his. He asked him if his four weeks of training were as good as my seven years in the university. They are out of touch with reality. Okay. And what happens now is that the police is getting better and better. They hire younger uh, people with their masters in computer science and cybersecurity and digital forensics, better labs, better training, better investigations, better reporting. I know that because I read the reports and I cannot find the mistakes that I would find 15 years ago. However, here's the problem. Uh, these are numbers from a Freedom of Information request from the Procurator Fiscals, the public prosecutors in Scotland. First row is the number of charges reporting on child pornography, on CSAM. Second row is how many of those charges were prosecuted. The third one is how many of the of the charges end up in a conviction. And the last one is how many of these had a custodial sentence, which meant that someone actually went to jail. And this is a chart of this data reported by the police over convicted overall. And you can see the orange ones are the convictions. If you look at 2007, 8, and 9, the conviction rates are better were better than they are now. But we do know that the police is getting better. That's a fact. And their investigations are better, and their reports are better, and their evidence is better, and then the convictions are not better. 
what is the only other variable in that equation? Jury. Eh? Jury. Uh, the prosecutors. Because not all of them actually go to jury. Okay. Some cases are just dropped because someone like me, like me comes with a report and then you know, it becomes embarrassing, they drop it. So some of them don't, don't even see a jury. Uh, total prosecuted to convicted, quality of, of convictions, which is the ones that has a custodial sentence. Oh, okay, sorry, they finished. So I'll just go through these last slides, okay. Um, same problems happened with uh, a training I did with uh, Interpol, uh, and the same problems that I saw in Southeast Asian countries were here in Scotland. And that's it. I'm starting a, a, this project, which is about digital evidence, so it's c computing law and criminology students uh, together, and anyone is welcome to join. And that's it. Uh, feel free to get in touch or stay in touch if you already are. Uh, thank you, sorry for, <laughs> for uh, pushing it for time. And um, any questions? Which one? Um, the one, actually, the very first one. Uh, this one? Ah, uh, this one. Ah, uh, yeah, the guy went to prison. Okay, but it had nothing to do with the digital evidence. Uh, my report was to act, my, my suggestion was to actually get rid of the digital evidence because the police had compromised it four ways. But it was not, it was not going to help or uh, the guy was arrested after the police were chasing him on the motorway and they found bags of, of drugs. <laughs> he was going down anyway. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, we've just played jury in the final example there. Do you think possibly a, Given that the original intelligence was regarding CSAM being... No, no, because the, the law... No, no, the, because the law at the end of the day is about possession. If it's either in your computer or your mobile phone or not. And the, the judge advised the jury to focus uh, on that. Which technically was correct, but it was ignoring the context of everything else. And it was ignoring the fact uh, that... There were three charges in total, and two of them, the judge agreed that there was no case to answer, and he just dropped them. So, but this is the unpredictability of the jury. Any la one last question? No. Thank you very, very much. It was a pleasure being you here, and nice to join uh, Tour de Hack. Uh, I'll be outside for a coffee. Uh, if you want to catch up with me in the next half an hour or something. Okay, thank you.